Kent Myers. I'm Mick Cornette, and it's time for the verdict. As a part of its traditional and continuing commitment to public and community service, Crow and Dunleavy Law Firm presents The Verdict, an objective discussion of contemporary legal issues hosted by Kent Myers. And also brought to you by a friend of Oklahoma Lawyers for Children and Delta Dental Plan of Oklahoma. And welcome to The Verdict. I'm Mick Cornett. Well, we're back with the second of two shows concerning law and the workplace. So let me introduce one of Oklahoma's top legal experts and as always my co-host Kent Myers. Mick, uh, we're really glad to get back into this subject because the last show we were able to show to the viewers just didn't cover all that we wanted to talk about. Uh, we have, I'm pleased to tell you, the same two guests back this week that we had on our previous show. And uh, we're going to talk about some different subjects, some new subjects. We're going to talk about sexual harassment in the, in the workplace, something that is always in the newspaper at least uh, and probably in the workplace more often than many of us know. We're going to talk about uh, discrimina discrimination against the disabled. We're going to talk about what does that phrase mean, national origin? How, how does one be discriminated against by virtue of their uh, national origin? We'll be talking about uh, uh, discrimination under the Americans uh, for Disabilities Act. Uh, what does that require? So I think it should be an interesting show. I think it will fill out our discussion about discrimination in the marketplace. And I hope uh, uh, encourage our viewers to think a lot about it and to talk to us on our website about what they like and what they don't like and what they'd like to see more of. Well, let's take a break and then get right to it. It's Law in the Workplace, and I would expect another lively discussion right here on The Verdict. I enrich our cultural landscape. I help define our quality of life. I am one of 4,000 artists in central Oklahoma who receive support from Allied Arts, this community's united arts organization. I am. I am. I am an Allied artist. It's got to be around here somewhere. Don't worry, we'll find it. Just calm down. I swear it was right here on the desk. All right, if I were a Will, where would I be? It's the only copy. Without it, we're out three million. I know, I know. Hey, accidents happen. If a condom breaks or you have unprotected sex. You have 72 hours to reduce your risk of getting pregnant. It's called emergency contraception. Got questions? Call Planned Parenthood. All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all of the quality assistance and representation that can be offered in our legal system. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children has over 350 of the best attorneys and volunteers in Oklahoma County who donate their time and services to represent children. For more information, call 405-23-CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. Welcome back to The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. We're ready to revisit the issue of law in the workplace. Kent, why don't you introduce our guests? Well, no better way, Mick, to uh, revisit this, is this issue than to have uh, the same guests back that we had before. Uh, I want to start out by introducing uh, to my left my partner and the dean of the labor and employment lawyers in Oklahoma, Leonard Court. Leonard is what is known as a haggy in Oklahoma because he is a combination of an 
Oklahoma State University Aggie and a Harvard Law School graduate, therefore Harvard Aggie Haggie. But in any event, we're really pleased to have you back, Leonard, and uh, we look forward to visiting with you again. Pleased to be back, Ken. Uh, we have uh, also again on my right, Holly Waldron. Holly is an employment uh, trial lawyer with EEOC, uh, deals with these issues every day, uh, and is a brand new mother uh, recently. And Holly, we're pleased to have you back. Thank you, Ken. Thanks Glad for joining here. us again. Holly, let me start with you, if I may. Uh, I want to start by uh, showing a, a graphic that we used uh, in our last show. It is an excerpt from uh, the United States Code, and it says it shall be un an unlawful employment practice to discriminate against any individual because of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Uh, let me ask you, Holly, assuming a worker thinks that that has happened to them, how do they proceed to get that matter before the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission or the courts? Kent, the first thing that a person has to do is come to the EEOC and file what we call a charge of discrimination. Uh, that person will meet with an investigator who will take some information from them and that will start the process. The person does have to come to our office and file that charge first before they proceed through the court system. Um, if I may, I would like to give uh, the phone number of our office here in Oklahoma City for Please people. Do. That's area code 405-239-4 I'm sorry, 231-4911, and our offices are located downtown Oklahoma City. Thank you. Leonard, uh, when does an employer find out that something like this is about to happen? Well, hopefully the employer finds out because the employee will try to solve the matter internally through some kind of grievance procedure where most employers, at least today, have some sexual harassment investigation mechanism. However, if the employee does go to the EEOC, the employer will find out by getting a copy of the charge in the mail and also some written requests for information that they then respond to as part of the investigation process. Well, you mentioned uh, sexual harassment. Let's talk about that a little bit. Um, how did, uh, is, is sexual harassment covered uh, in the graphic that we just uh, looked at? It is covered under sex discrimination. Yeah. Uh, is the area where it was made uh, to apply. Originally what we were talking about was what's known in the law as quid pro quo, that is sexual favors for promotions or if you refuse my sexual advances then I make your working career a living hell. That has uh, been added to now by a separate doctrine called the sexually hostile work environment. Not asking for sexual favors but the bad jokes, the lewd pictures, trying to get a laugh at somebody else's expense or some shock value uh, that ultimately can lead to some pretty dramatic consequences for an employer if they allow that to continue. Holly, just estimate for me roughly, if you can, what percentage of the uh, complaints that you deal with are in the uh, sexual uh, harassment area? I would say generally mo uh, the charges that we see dealing with sexual harassment would probably be 40 percent of what's filed in our office. Are they increasing or decreasing over the past few years, can you tell? Well, we saw an increase uh, when there became more public awareness of sexual harassment. We saw an increase in filings. I think that's leveled off now. It, it's, it tends to remain static over the last few years. Leonard, uh, what's prohibited uh, in the prohibition against sexual harassment? Well, obviously, the solicitation of sex is prohibited. The, the more difficult area is, is what we call the sexually hostile work environment. Frankly, I don't think the courts have done a very good job of telling us what is prohibited because each case has to be examined on its own merits. But what we try to teach our clients is to have people apply a simple rule. If it's conduct that would be offensive, if it happened to your mother, your sister, or your wife, then don't do it. Good rule of thumb. Um, I guess it applies, does it not, Holly, to uh, uh, offensive conduct against the same sex as well as an opposite sex uh, offense. That's correct, Kent. Anything that would be deemed um, offensive sexual behavior or behavior based on sex would be prohibited under Title VII. And I wanted to elaborate a little bit on something that Leonard said. Uh, Title VII is not meant to sterilize the workplace. I hear oftentimes, well, I can't even tell a joke anymore because I'm going to get sued. Well, that's not necessarily the case. Um, you really have to look at, at the totality of what's going on. And I think Ken, uh, Leonard's rule of thumb is a good one. If it, if it would be offended, if offensive to you, then don't do it. 
Well, that is a good way for employers and employees, I suspect, to look at it as well, because is this once again a situation where uh, the employer is responsible for the uh, perhaps uh, sexual wrongdoing of the employee? Absolutely. Uh, again, it's the employer who is financially on the hook under Title VII and who has the ultimate obligation to be sure that any complaints of harassment are investigated and if there's any validity to them that, that the correct action is taken against the offender. Holly, let me ask you about what I've heard called the rule of 15 uh, insofar as uh, the application of Title VII. Is there some number of employees uh, that uh, kicks in the application of Title VII? Yes, uh, an employer is covered under Title VII if they have 15 or more employees working for them. So if they have 14 employees, none of what we're talking about applies? That's correct. They may be covered under some state anti-discrimination laws, but as far as Title VII goes, you have to have 15 or more employees to be covered. Well, let me uh, change the subject now, uh, Leonard, and talk about uh, dis disabled workers, workers with disabilities. Uh, how are they protected now, and is this under Title VII or something else? No, Kent, this is probably our most recent discrimination statute. The Americans with Disabilities Act was passed in 1990, becoming generally effective in 1992. It's a very different statute. Uh, most of our other discrimination statutes are comparisons. If I discipline somebody who's black, what have I done with the Caucasian individual? Uh, the disability statute imposes an affirmative obligation on employers not only to not discriminate against the disabled, but to provide them with reasonable accommodation as long as it does not cause an undue hardship upon the employer so that if the disability is interfering with the ability to do what's called an essential function, but that interference can be eliminated with an accommodation, then the employer has the legal and economic responsibility to undertake that action. Why don't we go ahead and interrupt here and take a break. We'll be right back. You're watching The Verdict with Mick Cornett and Kent Myers. We're discussing law in the workplace. What's your verdict? girls. But hey, campfire is definitely for kids. So call the campfire office nearest you to join in on the fun. Because let's face it, you're not getting any younger. St. Gregory's University has been changing the lives of people like me for 125 years. Affordable, private Catholic education, balanced with dedication to community and service, makes St. Gregory special. We're extremely proud of our students' outstanding academic achievements and our nationally ranked athletic teams. It's when you help a student build a future of balance, integrity, and service that you change a life forever. St. Gregory's, a community for life. Yesterday was quite awful. You can say that again. On Broadway is Oklahoma's premier youth musical theater company. Bringing our daughter here was one of the smartest things we've ever done. I've learned a lot. I've gained a lot of confidence. They helped me develop talents I never knew I had. And it's fun. On Broadway, Oklahoma's premier youth musical theater company. Now enrolling in Edmond. Call 330-CAST. That's 330-2278. Every day, in state governments throughout the country, crucial decisions are being made that affect the lives of children and their families. But as this process takes place, children are often left voiceless. When these children raise their hands to be heard, is anyone listening? There are people listening. They are child advocates. Join us and raise your hand for kids. We're discussing law in the workplace. Welcome back to The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers and our special guest. Kent? We were talking about disabilities and how that uh, affected the, the workplace. Uh, Leonard, uh, we were talking earlier today about the Rule of 15. Does that also apply to the uh, Disability Act? Yes, it does, Kent. Uh, even though the ADA is, is a separate protection, 
the enforcement mechanism that Congress adopted is Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, so those same kind of requirements apply. Well, then are you telling me that an employer uh, can or cannot discriminate against an employee, for instance, just because they're in a wheelchair? You cannot just because they're in a wheelchair. If they can perform the essential functions of the job in question from that wheelchair, then you cannot discriminate against them. On the other hand, if they can't do the job and there are no way you can make reasonable modifications to that job, then you can refuse to hire do you, them. Do you have to make also reasonable modifications to their work hours to accommodate uh, that disability? There, there are uh, cases indicating that you should make those kinds of accommodations. Uh, particular health conditions, for instance, uh, may have an employee who has to be off for uh, dialysis, for kidney, something of that nature, then you are required to make some modifications to the work schedule, again, as long as they're reasonable and don't provide an undue hardship for the employer. Uh, Holly, let me uh, change the subject, but on the same general subject about disabilities, can you tell our viewers what are some types of disabilities that are covered and some types that are not? Well, under the ADA, uh, the courts are going to look at, does your disability affect a major life function? Does it affect your ability to walk, to talk, to work, to breathe, that sort of thing? Uh, something that, you know, would be a disability, obviously, would be someone in a wheelchair. Uh, someone who is probably not going to be considered to be a disabled person is someone who has, has hurt their back, but six weeks from now they're going to recover and they're going to be fine that person is not a disabled person and they, they are not entitled to the protection of the law. What about uh, the drug addict or the alcoholic? Uh, where do they fit into this? Well, someone who is actively using drugs or alcohol is not protected under the ADA. They're not considered to be a disabled person. On the other hand, someone who is in um, alcohol or drug treatment program and they're trying to recover from that that addiction they would be protected under the ADA and their employer would have to give them some accommodation um, for that disease. Why did they make that kind of distinction do you know? Well I think it's probably a policy issue. I, I, I don't think we should you know probably punish employers because and make them uh, retain an employee who's a liability to them who's a, a drug user an alcohol user uh, but someone who is, is, is trying to recover from that and become a productive person, then we, you know, we want to encourage that behavior from the employee. Leonard, uh, let's talk about religious discrimination now. Uh, uh, I noticed in our graphic that one of the things that is an unlawful employment practice is to discriminate against any, any individual because of religion. How does that come into uh, your practice, or what do you see in that regard? Kent, what we're dealing with there are really sort of two separate things. One is, again, like the ADA, an obligation to make reasonable accommodations to an individual's religion. If somebody, for instance, celebrates their religious holiday every Friday, every Saturday, then there may be some obligation to modify your work schedule to, to allow them to do that. They may have certain uh, types of dress uh, or other activities that, that are religiously oriented and you may have some accommodation obligation there. So that, that's one thing we're talking about. Separate and apart from that is the harassment of individuals because of their religion. If you went back to 1964 and, and looked at a lot of the congressional testimony, you would have seen a lot of concern about harassment of Jews and Catholics at that point in time. And while we like to think that all of that has been eliminated, the facts are it simply has not. There, there still is harassment going on in the workplace based on somebody's religious orientation. What do you see in that regard, Holly? Uh, that's true. Religious uh, discrimination complaints are probably, at least in Oklahoma, one of our, uh, we, we hear fewer of those than we do some of the other types of discrimination. But just recently, about a year ago, we had a case that involved religious harassment where uh, a fellow's coworkers were leaving him uh, nasty notes on his desk, th things that they knew he would be offended by because of his strong religious beliefs. So we still do see some of that coming into play. How do you deal with it? Do you just do you, can you deal with that on your own, or do you have to deal only in response to a formal complaint? Well, um, I think the first thing an employee should do is to see if they have if their employer has any type of grievance procedure or complaints procedure to go through. Uh, the law requires the employee to invoke their employer's grievance procedure, so they do have to put someone on notice that there's a problem going on. What if you get, I know some state agencies, for instance, Department of Human Services has a hotline, an anonymous hotline, where anyone can call up and complain about child abuse. What uh, does EEOC 
respond or act on anonymous complaints about bad conduct uh, in a particular workplace? We don't have a mechanism to, to address that. Uh, when you come to our office to file a charge, you can uh, remain anonymous if you choose so. However, um, your, your charge may not be investigated. Uh, we reserve the right to, to not take action on that. So you will have to make, make known your identity when you file that formal charge. Let's give each of our guests an opportunity here to kind of discuss and wrap up the issue. Leonard, what are some topics or advice or comments that you'd like to make that for one reason or another you haven't been able to make this week or last week? Well, Mick, I, I think my advice to employers is that there's, if there's any question uh, to get with somebody who knows and understands the law. A lot of employers try to save on legal expense by taking action without advice. The average cost of defending an employment discrimination lawsuit today for a single plaintiff is approximately $100,000, even if you win. That doesn't count your losses if, if you're unsuccessful. It's being penny wise and pound foolish to, to act without knowing what you're doing. What we try to do with our clients is to have them call before they terminate somebody or take a significant disciplinary action to double check and be sure that they're doing it the right way. If they do that, they'll never have to worry about Holly services coming to the fore <laughs> with the EEOC. <laughs> Holly? I would like to uh, point out uh, the EEOC's website that we have available for employees and employers. That's uh, eeoc.gov, G-O-V at the end. I would encourage everyone to take a look at that website. It has a lot of information about the laws that we enforce, a lot of do's and don'ts, questions and answers, and it's very informative. It goes much more in depth than we've been able to do here in our shows. And something else I would point out to uh, employers and employees is the EEOC's mediation program. When, an, when a person files a charge of discrimination with us, they have the opportunity to participate in free, a neutral confidential mediation and we have about a 65 percent success rate in our mediation program it works to resolve conflicts before they become huge and I would encourage um, everyone to take advantage of that if you have the opportunity to just a few seconds left what sort of penalties can the court impose I would assume there's monetary damages or reinstitute of the job but but Holly can there be criminal action uh, based upon an employer no this is strictly a civil statute but there can be monetary penalties, including back pay, front pay, reinstatement, and punitive damages, and an award of attorney's fees and costs to the person who's, who loses. Okay. Well, thank both of you for coming on. Thank you. Thank I've you. learned a lot. I hope our audience has, too. We've got to wrap it up. Ms. Waldron, Mr. Court, thank you very much for coming by. We'll be right back. Kent and I'll have a final word on the verdict. My name is Ted Smith. I'm president of the board of directors of the Oklahoma Disability Law Center. ODLC provides free legal services in civil matters to people with physical and mental disabilities. I'm Mike Sykes, vice president of ODLC. For more information, call 1-800-880-7755. The Oklahoma Disability Law Center provides high quality legal services to people with physical and mental disabilities. In Oklahoma, there are more than 1,600 children waiting to be adopted. They're of all ages. And for many, home has been a source of pain and conflict. They've dreamed of finding a better life and a loving family. Consider adoption. For more information, call 1-877-OK-SWIFT or visit the website www.okdhs.org. Adopt. It may be the toughest job you'll ever love. the best in each student. That is the simple goal and tradition of Heritage Hall. The focus on the individual shapes the educational experience at Heritage Hall. Each student benefits from small classes, able, dedicated teachers, a solid academic curriculum, and exceptional co-curricular programs of athletics, arts, community service, and other activities. 
parental involvement, personalized counseling, and the development of responsibility, integrity, and love of learning. If you want education taught with pride, then you want Heritage Hall. And welcome back to The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. We're wrapping up uh, today's segment, which dealt with law in the workplace. And Kent, we had a lot of information here. A lot, uh, particularly when you look back over the last two shows uh, we've done on this. Uh, but there's a lot out there, and I'm pleased we were able to cover as much as we could. There's one thing we didn't cover, and uh, uh, intentionally, because it will really justify a show of its own, and that is the... Uh, unlawfulness of discriminating based upon national origin. Now what that brings into play is language. Mm -hmm. uh, we had an initiative petition filed or proposed for filing in Oklahoma this year to make uh, English uh, the official language of Oklahoma and it would uh, make uh, it re a requirement that everything that you file with a state government agency has to be in English. It can't be in some other language. Uh, that raises all kinds of, uh, of uh, difficult feelings for people about whether or not that ought to be imposed on the uh, um, residents of Oklahoma mm -hmm. and citizens of the United States who have difficulty speaking English. Well, I suppose a government entity might be able to deal with one additional language besides English, but in our multiracial world that we live in, if you start to deal with several languages, I can see where it could be cumbersome. Yes. In fact, you can uh, just walk around the, uh, the Cowboy Hall of Fame or our National Memorial and just listen. Mm -hmm. And you will hear a lot of different languages. You will hear a lot of different tongues being spoken uh, that uh, let, uh, let you know that here in Oklahoma, as in the center of the country as we are, we get a lot of visitors and have a lot of residents from uh, uh, places that do not speak English. So just how we handle that uh, will be controversial, no doubt about it. Well, let's check on our website and give yeah. people a reminder. I want to remind you that uh, and show the graphic that uh, The Verdict's website is www.theverdict.tv. Encourage you to uh, uh, let us hear from you. Let us know what shows you'd like to have us present. Let us know uh, what guests you'd like to have us present, if we can, and we'll do our best to uh, round them up and get them here in front of the camera for you. Uh, we also uh, want you to check our links on the website. We think you'll see some links uh, in the near future to the EEOC and to other uh, organizations that uh, can help workers and can help uh, employers as well. Kent, nice job again. Well, it was fun. Thanks again to our guests, Holly Waldron and Leonard Court. For Kent Myers, I'm Mick Cornett. We'll see you next time on The Verdict. This program was brought to you by Crow and Dunleavy, a professional corporation. And also brought to you by a friend of Oklahoma Lawyers for Children and Delta Dental Plan of Oklahoma.